Hey, how's it going? And welcome to the Phoenix Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Shane Hubbard, and I'm really excited about today's episode because it revolves all around motivation. And we're going to hopefully debunk some myths about motivation and help you make a mental shift from a period where you feel motivated all the time to do something because it's new and exciting and, you know, you're changing something about your life to what happens when that motivation goes away and what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to follow the motivation train and only work out when, you know, you feel good about it? Or or is there another route that we can go down? So that's what we're going to talk about today. One of the things that I want to start doing at the beginning of episode episodes is sharing struggles of mine and successes of mine, not to, you know, make this about me, but to normalize the idea that you're going to have setbacks, you're going to have successes, and it's important to evaluate the setbacks and look at them objectively and not emotionally, but also celebrate the wins, no matter how small they are. Because one of the things that I, I noticed when I was coaching every single day is that a lot of people kind of brushed off the idea that they had, you know, a very what they would consider a very small success. To me, a success is anything that's progress in the direction that you want to head, whether that's you know a big thing or a small thing. It doesn't matter, and it's very much a personal thing to you. But feeling good, I don't think enough of us celebrate our wins for whatever reason. It could have been your upbringing. It could have been a number of different things. I know that for me, unless I got to the top tier reward, I really didn't consider it a a success. As I started coaching people and I started learning more and educating myself on how to be a good coach, I realized that any sort of progress is a success. And if you highlight those, you start to feel better about and, and notice the things that you are making progress on on a daily basis. So that's just something I wanna to kind of open up in the very beginning of episodes. So one of the setbacks that I had recently was life started becoming a little less predictable. Um, When I first started my journey back to fitness, it was at least the next seven days was pretty predictable. And then things started happening. You know, my daughter wasn't feeling that great. And so staying home from work was a, a, you know, something I had to adjust to. I'm obviously taking care of her instead of trying to fit in a workout and things like that. Sleep schedules weren't as uh, dialed in as they usually are. And so I had to make adjustments. And so one of the things that I had to do during this period was I think I got like three hours of sleep one night and I kept, you know, the thought that I kept having in my head was you only got three hours of sleep. You probably shouldn't work out. But then there was that part of me that was saying, logically, that makes sense because sleep is super important, but we've made a commitment here and life isn't always going to be, you know, an ideal situation. And in those unideal situations, you still have to show up for the things that you decided to commit to at the beginning of your journey. And while it might seem that that wasn't the best choice, In the moment of building a habit, it was sacrifice in the short term for progress and and routine building in the future. And so that's the choice that I made. And I'm glad I made that choice. In the moment, it didn't feel great. But in retrospect, looking back on it, it was the right choice to make in that moment. Because let's be honest, when you have a kid, you don't really sleep anyway. You might as well make the most of the things that you do have control over. And I had control over making the choice to work out. So that was a, a setback that I had. But the success was is that although I could have easily and logically gone with the take a rest kind of mindset. It was one of those things that needed to be done in order to progress my mindset and my routine for my new habit. So that was the success. There was another success, but I'll save that for the rest of this episode because it pretty much ties directly into that episode. So I feel like that was kind of organically a nice segue into today's episode, which is again, talking about motivation and understanding, you know, when motivation dies, what are you supposed to do? Let's paint a picture really quick because I think we've all been down this road. And if you haven't, then just imagine along with us. I'm sure you've gotten really excited. Maybe it's in January, beginning of the year. Maybe it's some other time of the year, but most of us get pretty excited at the beginning of the year to start getting back in some sort of healthy routine. And that can be different for everyone. But for the sake of this example, let's just say it's going to the gym or working out and eating on a more regimented plan that focuses on healthier foods, focuses on, you know, not overeating, that focuses on not being restrictive, but understanding the limits calorically in order to, you know, have a, some sort of loss of body fat, if that's your goal, whatever your goal is, it doesn't really matter. But the point is, this is when you get all excited, right? Um, If you've ever been in a relationship, when you have a new relationship with somebody, especially a romantic one, there's that honeymoon phase. So I'll be using that term to describe this 
honeymoon phase of fitness that lasts usually about two weeks. Sometimes it lasts the entire month of January, but in my experience, most people get really excited for two weeks and then that dopamine rush sort of dies. And what I would say at least 90% of people do is they sort of wonder, well, you know, I'm not really motivated by this anymore. And so they slowly fall off and then life gets in the way and all these things start to pile up and it becomes harder and harder to stick to the routine that they had originally set for themselves. So we're going to talk about what to do in those situations as well as some hard truths that you're just going to have to deal with. Okay, so the first thing you have to realize is, is that the high that you feel is not a result of actually doing the work. It's it's just a dopamine rush of starting anything new. So that's the first thing you have to understand is that that's going to go away. And that is not a necessary requirement for working out. There's if you talk to any or you hear any stories about famous, successful people, whether they're writers or businessmen or whatever, the one thing they all have in common is that. When things aren't ideal, they still show up. They still show up for the meeting. They still show up for work. They still do the things that need to be done, even when they don't feel like doing it. And that's because the only way you're going to be successful is if you put in the reps. If you only ever work out or you only ever eat right when you feel good, when you feel like it, then you're probably in the situation that you are in right now, which is you're not seeing continual progress day over day or month over month or year over year. You're seeing sort of this ebb and flow where, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I feel great. And sometimes you're like, I feel lousy. And that might be a point to look at too. You know, why, why is it so difficult for you to maintain kind of this middle level and you're always on a high or always on a low? That's a topic for another episode, but motivation is not required to work out. It's not required to do anything, honestly. I mean, if that was the case, then most of us wouldn't go to work or we'd go to work three days a week, you know? So having to show up, you know, I kind of treat my workouts and and eating sort of like I do my mortgage. Like if I don't pay it, I'm screwed, right? So if I don't eat right, if I don't do my workouts, I'll be screwed. It might not happen, you know, the following month. It might not be happen when rent is due, so to speak. But there is some point in my life down the road where I'm going to pay for the fact that I didn't take care of my health. I didn't, you know, eat in a fashion that's going to be the most beneficial for my health. Those things are all going to happen if I don't pay my dues right now. Now, that being said, things might happen in my future that no matter how healthy I eat or how you know, diligently I work out, they're going to happen. And so be it. But why take the risk of those things being magnified when I can try to reduce those risks very easily? And there are lots of things that are pretty much guaranteed, like all co- all cause mortality decreases if you are somebody who is healthier. It's just a fact. That becoming important to you is a whole different story. But you start to see that when you go from this, this honeymoon phase where you're, you're motivated by the hype and the dopamine rush of starting something new, when you start to feel that wane off and you start to feel that sort of die, you have to start planting into your brain. And I would recommend even writing this down. You can go back to the last episode where we had those 10 creeds. They all apply to this sort of understanding that the most successful in fitness and nutrition routines and the healthiest people don't just work out or eat right when they're motivated to do it. They do it every single day. And they do it in a way that's sustainable so that they don't feel like they're climbing a mountain every single time they're trying to improve themselves. Small things done often are very beneficial. So don't, don't override that. Like, you know, if you have a calorie deficit, deficit, that's only 200 calories, you might think, well, that's not a lot. Well, over the course of seven days, repeated over weeks and months, that's going to produce some results. So don't discount the small things. Okay. So the mindset shift, what do you have to start thinking about? Other than realizing that you don't need to be motivated to do these things, you also have to start thinking long term because in the honeymoon phase, everything feels good almost immediately after. And because you're riding on a high that's, I won't say it's artificial because it is organic, but because you're riding on a high that is not going to be sustained through the rest of your life that might ebb and flow, like it'll come back at some point, right? Maybe you start a new workout program and you're excited for that, or maybe you're getting closer to the trip that you're preparing for it. So you get excited for that. It's going to ebb and flow. But in this valley of low motivation that you're in right now, you have to start thinking differently and you have to start thinking, I just need to put an effort. That was one of our creeds in the last episode is effort over quality, quality over quantity. So in these moments where you're feeling that low, just show up. If your workout doesn't go exactly how it's written out or exactly how you have it organized or whatever, you know, however you're doing it, focus on the fact that you're just showing up. Because when you just show up, you do the thing that's the most important. And I don't 
think that's talked about enough that showing up is the most important thing. Everything that happens after that is great, but when you're just starting off, showing up is the most important thing. If you're a veteran, you're one, you're probably not listening to this podcast, but when, when you're a veteran, quality becomes the most important thing because you're already in the routine. You're already showing up. You're all already doing that, that beginning work of just getting it done. Then quality starts becoming more important. And then repeating that quality through quantity becomes the third most important thing. But when you're in this valley of like, I don't even want to do this, showing up is the most important thing. In the last episode, I gave the example of driving to the gym and just sitting on one of the machines or just signing in and like sitting there. And that's an example I got from the book Atomic Habits, which was a real life example from a reader of the book that they sent to the author. And I thought that was so, it made such a mindset shift for me because before I heard that, if you were to drive to the gym, show up and not do anything, to me, that would be a waste. And you might be thinking the exact same thing, like what a waste of time. But when you're building habits, the most important thing is showing up. It's just getting getting some sort of progress. Like if you used to just stay in bed, if you wake up and put on the clothes and then let's say you're working out in your garage like I do and you just go in there and like do 10 jumping jacks and you're like, all right, I'm done. You showed up. It's a small level of progress in the grand scheme of things, but again, not enough of us measure these small pieces of progress. We're, we're trying to achieve something that might be further down the road that we're just not ready for yet. And that's a common thing that I see. You know, I, I'll, I'll hear people say like, oh, I'm working out five days a week from the get-go. I'm, you know, starting the keto diet or whatever. I'm not picking on keto. I'm just whatever diet on Monday. And they're like piling their plate on with all these different things they have to do. And they haven't even started yet. And so they're setting themselves up for failure because there's too much on their plate. They're, they're trying to tackle too many things. When I would work with clients and I'd say, you know, what would you like to do? I would allow them to put all that food on their plate and then tell them like, yeah, no, you got to take that off. And they'd be like, why? And I'm like, well, that's too big of a thing in the beginning. And I'd have to kind of coach them down to understanding, listen, if you could actually do this, that you think that, you know, all these things you're going to do, you wouldn't need me, right? The reason why you're coming to me for advice or you're paying me as your coach is because whether you realize it or not, you are asking me, hey, I'm not having success with this. I need you to figure out why. And I need you to help me have success because I'm tired of failing. Great. Well, then you have to accept the fact that you're probably wrong about your approach. You probably have to, you know, be told like, hey, you're wrong. And lots of people don't like being told wrong, even though they're clearly not the expert in something. There's just something about that that we don't like as humans. Anyway, so you, you, you have to realize that, that you probably have too much on your plate. And you also have to buy into the idea that having less on your plate is not a bad thing. I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know if it's a human thing because I'm sort of in the middle of it and I still do this from time to time is I want to try to tackle as much as I can at once. Like just keep throwing stuff on my plate and then I'll let you know if I can't eat the rest of it. Like I'd rather do that than not put enough on my plate. But there's actually more in this scenario anyway, there's more benefit to having less on your plate because when you have less on your plate, you are focused more on one particular thing, which means you're going to be able to have more success with it. And the research shows that the more success you have in the beginning, the more likely you are to repeat that and then be able to take on more and then actually continue on that momentum. And that momentum turns into a habit, habits turn into routines. And pretty soon you're moving past the effort portion of the the equation because you've already got that dialed in. Now you're dialing into the quality stuff. Now your workouts are becoming a little bit more complicated, but you can handle it. Your, your meal plan or your calorie deficit becomes a little bit more consistent because you've got other things that are already automated, right? If everything is being done manually, that's very time consuming. It takes up a lot of willpower and it's very easy to burn out on that. But if you take one thing, master it, automate it, I'm thinking in terms of like programming and optimization, like in business, but it applies to this. When you take one thing, master it, automate it, then you make room for a second thing and a third thing and a fourth thing. And that's how you have to approach it as as logically, objectively as you can, because it very much is a system and creating habits and creating routines is a system of operations. And when you understand that, you know, whether you're a business person or not, when you understand that you have to master optimize optimize and then automate, then you can move on to something else. And that's a very, it can be kind of hard to get your head around. And I know for me, when I was first adopting this mindset and practicing it, it felt like that's all I have to do today. Like all I have to do is focus on lunch. Like that was easy. Yes, it was. It was easy today, but is it going to be easy on day two, on day three? How, how are you going to be able to stay consistent with that? 
When you lose your motivation, you have to go from thinking a single day at a time to understanding that multiple days added up is where the challenge is. I'm not as interested in what you can do in a single day. I'm interested in what you can do 30 days in a row. So when you're building your, your daily routine, when you're, when you're going into that workout that you don't really want to do, you have to think, yes, this might not be something I want to do, but I can't break the chain. This might be an old example by now, but if you haven't heard it yet, it's one of my favorites. So Jerry Seinfeld had this rule when he was first starting off as a comedian, and he had a calendar. And the calendar had, you know, all 30 days or how many days were in that, that month. And he had a rule. He said, listen, I don't have to write my entire stand-up comedy. I don't have to come up with a great joke every single day, but I have to work on it for a certain amount of time every single day. And I can't break that chain. That's my rule. That's how I'm going to build the routine. That's how I'm going to become a better comic is I have to work on it to whatever capacity that I can every single day. Some days it was 10 minutes. Some days it was 30 minutes. I don't know what his schedule looked like, but if we're applying this to fitness, that means that if you have a really detailed and, and time-consuming workout, let's say it takes an hour, you have to go to the gym, the machines have to be available. Let's say you have that workout on a Monday. Something happens Sunday night, doesn't matter what it is, it throws off your routine. Monday morning now feels like climbing a mountain, whereas before it felt like you were just stepping over an anthill. And so in that scenario, you might go, oh, well, screw it. I can't even do my workout. No, we have to make that mindset shift. Yes, that, that 100% effort that we were going to put into that specific workout, that's no longer on the table. But that doesn't mean we go to zero. It means we go to 40, 50, 60%. What does that look like? And that's kind of the hard part, right? Like if you had this really detailed and planned out workout, what does 60% of that look like? Well, let's break it down. Let's say it's an hour. Well, let's break that down to 30 minutes. Do you have 30 minutes? You might say no. Okay, well, do you have 20 minutes? 15 minutes. Yes, I do. Okay, great. So what can we do in 15 minutes that's going to be beneficial? Well, we can cut back on traveling time. We don't even have to go to the gym. Let's go to our garage. Let's do a body weight circuit with minimal rest or you know less rest than we normally would. Let's bang out as many rounds of push-ups, squats, you know, leg raises for abs as we can in 15 minutes. Boom, you solve the problem. So it's a shift. It's not, a, it's not an elimination. It's not, I'm not gonna do my workout because I can't complete it in this fashion. It's, I need to make an adjustment because my life is always moving. Right. When I was a trainer, my life was very, very like open ended. Like I had so much time. I worked five to six hours on a good day, which means that I had this rule where if I worked six hours, I had to work outside of the gym two hours on my business, on my research, on my content, whatever. I always had to work an eight hour shift. But a lot of times I would only work like four hours a day. And so I would have the luxury of just getting a workout in, no problem. That's not the case anymore, and it's probably not the case for you either. So you, you don't really have a lot of wiggle room. If you committed an hour, but it's just not going to be feasible, what can we dial that down into? And maybe you start there. Maybe you're not the person who can commit an hour, but you can com commit 15 minutes. So going back to the what to do when you're not motivated, you have to constantly have plan B and plan C. Plan A is the workout in the most ideal situation, and that rarely is going to happen until you build a routine possibly, or maybe your schedule opens up, whatever it might be. Plan B is 80, you know, 60 to 80% of what plan A was, and plan C is like just show up, like just do something. I don't care if it's you know 100 push-ups that day. It doesn't matter. The importance is not how you know on brand, or that's not even the right way to put it, on plan that the workout is, it's that you kept the routine. That is always the most important part. Because when you keep the routine, it's much better to do a workout that is like 30% of your max than it is to do no workout because not working out has so many more routine killing effects. It's really easy. Not a lot of people give momentum the credit it deserves. Like when you're in a routine and you've spent all that time building the routine, when you lose the momentum, maybe you've already known, noticed this, when you lose that momentum, that's a huge part of being able to stay consistent. So losing that momentum should, not losing that momentum, I should say, should be your number one goal. And that's when it goes, you know, it gets, goes back to one of my favorite creeds, effort over quality, quality over consistency. I'm sorry, that's not right. Effort over quality, quality over quantity. That's, that's the plan A, B, and C that you kind of have to think of. So getting back to the root of today's episode, which is motivation, let's kind of recap really quickly. One, you don't need motivation to work out, nor should you ever rely on it. That feeling you get in the honeymoon phase, that's just a bonus. The problem with that is I actually think it, for a lot of people that don't know this, it's, it's more of a detriment than it is a motivation. 
right? I mean, it's great when you start, but unless you know how to shift out of that properly, it actually is the reason why most people quit, why you see gyms being empty in February, March, and April, and then everyone realizes, oh, summer's like a month away, so May and June looks packed, right? And then people are like, oh, summer's over. I'm not going to be you know, half naked anymore. You know, time to put my winter coat back on and they shift, you know, shift out of the gym again. So that's one, that's one thing you have to realize is motivation's not necessary. The other things you have to realize is, is that it's going to feel good eventually to be as disciplined as you are because you become more mentally tough. You become more mentally resilient. And if there's one thing that I can say about myself is that working out and sticking to a plan and being diligent about that plan has always made me a better person. It's made me now a better husband. Now that I have a daughter, it's made me a better father. It's made me a better coworker. It's made me better in every single situation of socialization of, I mean, there's so many benefits to being disciplined that I don't think it's talked about enough. And maybe it does. And I'm just not you know, in the know about it, but there's other benefits that you might not consider sexy or cool or fun, but they are going to make your life better and they will show up at some point in your life. It's not going to be the bicep pump that you get. It's not going to be feeling, you know, sore necessarily. It's going to be the things that are underneath the surface that over time you start to realize, oh, this is making me a better person. This is making my quality of life better. This is making my energy better. People want to be around me more. Maybe you don't want people to be around you more. But the point is, is that you, you become a better person and you feel good about that. Your confidence increases. Your self-esteem increases. I can't tell you how many men that I've trained who are kind of at a low point in their life who start working out and just say, I feel so much better about myself, not in like a lovey dovey way, but I just, I don't feel like a piece of shit. That's kind of how men talk about it, but it's true. It's like, I don't feel like I'm wasting my life anymore. And some people might not feel that right away, but there's, at least in my experience, there's this, this underlying subconscious feeling that you're wasting your life. You're wasting your time. You don't get that when you stay consistent and diligent to a plan. And, and Hey, maybe this is easy for me to say being 19 years deep into figuring all this stuff out. But I still remember what it was like 15, you know, 15, 16, 17, like right as I was junior, senior in high school, going to college, I remember, you know, noticing like, Hey, I feel way better than my freshman year, my junior year. I'm more confident. I, you know, still struggle with things, but I'm better off than I was. And it feels because it feels good to accomplish things. Even if that accomplishment isn't the biggest thing in the world, it, it still feels good. So dialing it back, motivation is not necessary. It's the first thing you have to learn. It's not. Showing up is necessary. You have to shift from understanding that like, hey, this is not always going to be sexy, fun, and cool, and realize that I just had a long day at work. You know, my boss wasn't happy with me today. I don't feel like going to the gym. It doesn't matter. You don't need to feel like going to the gym to go to the gym. I would even argue that some of the worst days that you have are probably the best days to work out. Because a lot of times, if you do a workout properly, and you don't just try to kill yourself in the gym, you feel good afterwards. You do. It's just, it's part of the natural cycle of the workout. It might not feel great when you're, you know, pushing the weight and you're on your last rep and you're struggling to, you know, rack it back up or whatever it might be. But afterwards, there's, there's adrenaline, there's a dopamine rush that you get. And that's going to make you feel better on a day where you felt like all of your, everything that you did was a, a loss or a failure, right? That's a good day to go work out. That's a good day to blow off some steam. That's another side benefit. So, while I know it's not easy and I know it might not, this might not be the switch that you need, I need you to understand that motivation is not necessary. And getting to that stage where you just show up and that's what's most important to you and putting that in your brain and saying, it doesn't matter if I have the best workout in the world. It doesn't matter if I was perfect with my lunch. What was important was that I showed up and I did whatever I could based on my circumstance. That's always the most important thing. And I can tell you from experience personally and as a coach, the most successful people in fitness, they understand that, they adopt that, and they execute that. It's as simple as that. And it seems too simple sometimes. It seems like, wow, that's that just feels too basic. Well, I mean, it is, right? I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come to me, whether it's a client or a follower on social media and be like, yeah, but listen to this entire story. Listen to all the effed up things that happened to me. Listen to all the craziness that happened. You couldn't do 50 squats that day though? How long is that going to take you? Five minutes? You know what I mean? Like there's really no effort too small on a day that feels like, you know, it's just chaotic, crazy, nuts. The problem I think what most people do is they try to do 
the workout they planned in an ideal situation in the most unideal part of that situation. So you always need three different plans. And they don't have to be written out like every single day, but you just need a general idea. Okay, the most ideal situation would be going to the gym. The gym would be empty enough to where I can do all the exercises without having to wait for somebody else to stop using it. It would only take me an hour or 45 minutes to an hour. And there would be no traffic on the way home. Dinner would be ready when I get home or I, you know, whatever. Those are all ideal situations. Very rarely does that ever happen. And if it does, you probably aren't even expecting it. So plan A is not even something that I think most people can do. Plan B. Plan B is I have 30 to 45 minutes to work out, ideally, like actually work out. And that's waiting for people to get off machines. That's, you know, whatever. All the different situations that happen with that. Plan C is I can't even make it to the gym, but I can go out in my garage. I can go to my living room. I can watch an exercise video on YouTube. I've got a Peloton subscription. This is not a plug for them. I'm just saying, you know, maybe you do. I don't have any of those things, but I know that I could do squats, push-ups, and leg raises as many times as I can with minimal rest in 15 minutes. Boom, done, sold. That's, that's it. That's, those are the three things. Motivation is not required. Have two plans, backup plans, and execute. That's it. That's the episode. It really is that simple on paper. And I realize that life is not that simple, but that's why we plan for it, right? If, if there's one thing I've understood since having my daughter, and, or you know, even before that, having a nine to five job is like time's limited, right? So what, what can you do in 15 minutes? I honestly think the more you realize what you can do in 15 minutes, the easier getting into a fitness routine is. And you might be thinking, well, what if I'm always doing plan C? So what? What's wrong with that? Maybe your plan C is really your plan B because, you know, you're, I don't, I can't think of the most perfect situation, but let's pretend you're a nurse, right? You're working crazy hours. You might not even, it might not even be logical for you to work out based on sleep deprivation, hours work, exhaustion. That person can even do their plan C. They can do 15 minutes of whatever. One thing to close out on, and this is something again that I had learned that I had talked about. I think I talked about my Instagram story. I don't know where it was, honestly. It's making so much content these days. I don't know where it is. But my daughter was taking a nap over the weekend, and I thought, perfect. I'm going to take a nap too. I'm exhausted. I was literally falling asleep on the couch as she was winding down for her nap. And I thought, yeah, but I got three workouts this week I got to do, and I've only done two of them. I need to go work out. I don't need a nap. And part of what was fun for me, and maybe this is just because I'm crazy, is I was like, I'm going to prove myself that I'm about to fall asleep, but I could still do a workout. And that's another thing that's really important to do in these moments of struggle and where they're not ideal is if you can prove to yourself that you can do things in unideal situations, you become more mentally resilient to change, to obstacles, to stress that is out of your control because you understand that you can do hard stuff. And not only do hard stuff, but you can execute important things for you, whether it's for your health or your family or your business, you can execute those things without having all the resources lined up perfectly. I was about to fall asleep. You might think, well, how are you going to work out when you're about to fall asleep? Yeah, you'd be surprised. First of all, doing bench press, you're laying down, right? Second of all, when you're working out, your body is essentially responding to a fight or flight sort of scenario. Like your body thinks, oh, something bad is happening. I got no time to sleep. Let's shut that off. Let's upregulate adrenaline and let's do this. And so you, you, your energy shifts when you shift. I'm not saying you should never sleep and just work out. Like that's the extreme, right? My point is, is that you'd be surprised what you can do in, in unideal situations. You would, you would be surprised. And the reason why you don't think you can is because you haven't tried. It's because you haven't said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to just try to do this, right? I'm about to fall asleep. Let's work out. I, uh, you know, everything went to shit when I thought I was going to go to the gym. I'm going to go jump into the garage and do a 15 minute workout. That's the mind, sh- mind shit. That's the mindset that you have to have. Because if you don't have that mindset, you just go back to the same old routine and the same old cycle of failing that you had before. You have to make that commitment. And it's not easy. It's going to be tough. But the more you get around people, the more, you know, shameless plug, the more you listen to this podcast the more you're going to start thinking that way. And it becomes normal to think that way because you're surrounded by that thought process. And you don't feel so weird or out on the fringe for doing that. Unless you're like me and you're like, you've always just been a fringe person. You've just always lived outside of what people think is normal. And you start to get comfortable in that area. But I digress. So my point is, these are the things you have to start thinking about. And if anything that I've talked about, if you're still listening, if anything that I've talked about is unfamiliar, scary, something that you're kind of like, I don't want to do that. Give it some time. Think about it. I'm not saying you have to, you're going to make this shift tomorrow. 
it took me probably like four years of going through the honeymoon phase and then like going through this depression phase where it was like, oh, this doesn't feel fun anymore. It took me a couple iterations of that to finally go, I think it was something that Jocko Willink said. He was like, I don't like doing this. My motivation died a long time ago. I do it because I need to, and I'm on a mission. You know, he's ex-military, so, you know, that dude's locked in 24-7. But the point is, is that I had to be told that motivation wasn't necessary. I had to be told that the most important thing was showing up. I had to be told, and I had to get it through my head that those were important from people that I respected that had a pedigree in things that I was like, well, that dude's a Marine. If there's anyone who can teach me about mental toughness, it's that guy. That's the kind of stuff that you need to hear. And that's why I made this episode. So anyway, I know this went a little bit longer than normal. I think we're at like the 35 minute mark or something like that, but I'm just going to roll with this until it stops feeling, stops feeling like it's benefiting you. So we're going to end today's episode. Thanks a ton for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, please let me know. I really want to make sure that I am talking about things that is relevant to you, that is helping you on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and so on. This isn't for me. I'm not doing this because I like to hear myself talk or any of that. I'm doing this for you. So let me know whether it's on social media at Shane Humberfit on Instagram and on YouTube. Instagram is the best place to reach out to me. You know, slide into the DMs as the cool kids say. Do whatever you need to do to get some feedback. Um, you know, let me know if I can help you. If your question is private, I'll keep it, you know, anonymous, all that good stuff. Uh, but I want to help you, you know, so feel free to ask questions. If you have them, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thanks for tuning into the t- today's episode. I will see you in the next episode. Let's wet the old whistle before we get started. People still say that? I highly doubt it. That's like something my grandfather probably said. Mm